As the young bar players woke up, they were greeted with a very festive scene for the 2004 Christmas Day Boys Bar. Can I get up? Oh, sorry. Sorry. Can I get up? James, I didn't trouble you to get a photograph of you by yourself. You look nice. The honour of throwing up the bar today fell to James Miller, <laughs> editor of the Arcadian and a staunch supporter of Kirkwall's traditional street game. Duncan, Bobby, you're in it, so can you look in here? No one could have guessed, as James hurled the bar from the market cross into the waiting park, that the game would eclipse the main's event in terms of duration, excitement and sheer entertainment. Come on, 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 come on,
With a large and expectant crowd gathered, the underfoot conditions are going to be a determining factor in this game. With the packs evenly matched, it was going to be difficult for either side to make gains on Broad Street. As in any bar, when the bar breaks, players can get hurt, but the main thing is that there are always people there to look after them and make sure no serious injuries occur. Hey, hey. 
with underfoot conditions now becoming ice rather than snow, the pack often falls and collapses onto the deck, but good consideration is shown by both sides ensuring younger players are helped to their feet.
With the bar having hardly moved from the cross, spectators were already speculating as to what would happen if the boys were still there when the men's bar was due to start. With the bar being held up in the middle of Broad Street and moving slightly towards the uppy goal, the centre erupts, but it's not long before the players lose their footing and the bar is back on the deck. Oh, <laughs> 
At approximately 12.30, with a bar moving down towards the cathedral steps, the uppies break towards Judith Blues. However, the Doonies were next to break with her, this time across the street and onto the cut green, scattering spectators in all directions. Where is it? With the snow falling heavily, the bar did not stay in the cut green long, with another break taking it back onto the street where the park regrouped. With a period of fierce and ferocious play, the Oppies break on several occasions, and at approximately 12.50 they reach the Royal Bank of Scotland corner. Here the Dunies managed to get the bar on the ground in the group before the Oppies tried to get it into Victoria Street. A concerted effort by the Dunies forced it into Tankerness Lane. As the main bar started, the boys gradually moved the game down the lane towards Junction Road and across ending up against the taxi office windows. Here the first big break of the game took place. The Doonies ran the bar along Great Western Road, just past the fire station buildings before being stopped at approximately 10 past 1, with the pack quickly reforming. Come on, Abby! Come on! Who 
Push. Come on, we're not at it in this way. Come on! Keep it tight, everybody! Oh, yes, keep it! Yeah, let's do it. Fuck off! Come on, get it! Keep 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 it! After a period of approximately half an hour where the bar broke back and forth, between the fire station and the hydro garages, the Uppies made a sudden and determined break towards their goal, only to be stopped at the mouth of West Castle Street. Following a period of open and loose play, the bar can be seen clearly on several occasions against the snow-covered streets. Even the cameraman becomes involved unintentionally. Oh, 
At 20 to 3, and after several attempted at breaks, the decisive break from Great Western Road is made towards Junction Road. <laughs> with extremely difficult underfoot conditions, the break continues with the bar being forced towards Junction Road only for the pursuing park and spectators alike to be confronted by an oncoming snowplow. The park again lose their footing and the bar is again on the deck at the roundabout in full view of the men's game as it heads towards the uppy goal. With the men's game being concluded, the boys' bar is now opposite McEwen's shop. Obviously, the Uppy boys take heart from this, but the Doonies have other ideas. <laughs> With the time at 5 to 3, another decisive break is made by the Doonies, only to be stopped by a last gasp sliding tackle. <laughs> With a huge crowd now gathered after the conclusion of the men's bar, another break by the Dooney sees the bar getting as far as the old petrol pumps at Chain W. Tate's and Bobby's Cycle Shop.
Det er en bed i der, for nu er vi ude. Hun er der, det kan du vente til, at man er slået på det bare lige. Det er det, du var i bare så lige. Sometimes it's difficult to pick up the centre of the pack due to the large numbers of spectators that have crowded round to watch the bar. <laughs> With darkness falling and relentless pressure from the dunies towards the harbour, there seems to be just one outcome to this. But who knows in this enthralling game? With the pack size having decreased due probably to fatigue suffered by the younger players, Dooney girls join in and push towards the icy waters of the basin. Come on boys, come on boys! At 7 minutes past 4, the park lurches against the railings at the basin opposite the Garno, and the bar is ripped from the park and dropped onto the slipway before rolling slowly into the cold, clear water. It is 
not long before the Dooney claimants are in the water, but is handed over quickly to a popular winner of the Christmas 2004 Boys Bar, John Tate. It is not long before Tron is hoisted aloft at the pier head, in front of the waiting crowd, which must be the biggest that has been seen for many a day at the end of a boys' bar. A truly remarkable game, played in great spirit, showing that the bar is in good hands for many years to come. Here we see Betty Donaldson preparing to throw up the boys bar New Year's Day 2005. Betty has a long association with the bar. Her father was David Horn, who was a veteran bar reporter and wrote for the Orkney Herald for many years under the pseudonym Cubby Roo. <laughs> After the heroics of Christmas Day, Everyone in the mass spectator ranks wondered if it would be a game of a similar stature. Like the men's bar, the boys' game seems to be developing similar traits. Once the bar is thrown up, both sides come together on the cut wall to gauge the strength of opposition. At approximately 5 to 11, a break by the Dooney sees the bar taken down as far as lows. The uppies are having none of it and rally quickly and the bar is brought back to the cut green where some of the younger players experience the crush of the low dyke. Thankfully, no one is hurt and the game continues. Oh, 
As soon as the centre of the bar becomes unstable, all bar players know that the bar can appear at any time. Here we see a perfect example of this, with the bar player going over the top and the bar squirting out the side when a break is made onto the cut green. With players on the ground, some on the outskirts take their eye off the game and suddenly the bat is in the clear and a break is made returning the game to the street. Here we see classic bar play. A break by the hobby sees the whole pack moving towards Victoria Street, only for the bar to be snatched from their grass and head back down towards Albert Street. With the bar having returned to the cut green, everyone is taking a breather when suddenly the bar erupts and it is clearly seen as it is thrown towards the street. A small knot of players gather her up briefly before an uppie makes a dash for it, only to be decked soon afterwards.
past 12, the pack is again up against the cut green wall, as the players wrestle for control. The bar breaks onto the cut green, scattering spectators caught off guard, and with players heading for the tourist office car park. With a sizeable crowd already gathered to watch the boys bar and getting bigger with the imminent arrival of the players for the men's game, spectators speculate as to what will happen if the two bars are on Broad Street at the same time, a decision that the bar committee will have to deliver on. As you can see from the top of the picture, the Abbey men players are starting to gather in the mouth of Victoria Street and the boys game is still on Broad Street. Come on, 
Like their counterparts, the Dooney men stand together in the entrance to Albert Street, showing respect for the boys' bar, wondering when the men's game would start, always aware of the safety of bar players and spectators alike. with the bar committee making the decision not to start the men's game until the boys have left Broad Street. An amazing piece of luck occurs at one minute past one. The Dooney boys seize control and push the pack round the corner into Castle Street, with the men's game able to start at two minutes past one.
now with huge numbers of people watching both men's and boys' bars simultaneously, loyalties were going to be divided. Should they continue to watch this enthralling boys' game or the traditional men's encounter?
After a period of sustained centre pressure the full length of Castle Street, the bar is taken over the low dike at Tullock's and into the rear car park, with players and spectators desperate to keep up. The break is soon halted and the play comes to a standstill with a bar on the deck on Junction Road. As the bar moves towards the harbour, the pack collapses and players are trapped in the ground. Fortunately, good sportsmanship is shown and understanding of the game enables everyone to get to their feet.
After a period of spirited play by both sides, a decisive break is made, with the ball being ripped clear and a lone runner heads towards the pier. This, however, is not a dunny, rather an uppie, who heads up past Albert Square and into Mount Holy Lane. The break, unfortunately for them, does not get far before the whole pack regroups in front of the Arcadian bookshop. As with last week's game, this was turning into a classic. The Doonies make a break but are soon foiled and the pack momentarily comes to a halt outside Woolies. <laughs> Not to be outdone, the Oppies wrestle control and the park erupts, spilling spectators in all directions. The bar is carried quickly up Lane Street with already tired players in hot pursuit. The spectators cannot believe what they are witnessing. Is this going to eclipse last week's game? The break from Lane Street followed King Street into Copeland's Lane, down Palace Road and into Watergate, past the old police station and down Victoria Road. It was here that the Doonies managed to catch up and the bar spilled along Victoria Street and into the square opposite William Shearer's. From here, after several failed attempts of a smuggle, the bar was taken back up Victoria Road coming to rest against the Keeley's Wall. It was not long before the bar is heaved over the wall and into the gardens. Here the play was open, fast and furious, with players trying dummy runs by stuffing neeps up their jumpers to add to the confusion. With the bar having been taken out of the kiddies and run down the clay lawn, it is momentarily stopped at the entrance to Main Street by frantic duny efforts, only for the bar to re-emerge with an uppy runner continuing to run down the clay lawn and into Junction Road towards the uppy goal.
with bar players and spectators alike thinking that the game is over, they head towards the corner. But this is not the case, as the obby break was stopped short at Grain Court. It is not long before the whole pack reforms, and then the bar is thrown through the air in a last-ditched effort by the Dunis. As with last week's game, it is full of commitment and passion, with all players trying their hardest, with break after break being made by both sides only to be thwarted by their counterparts. Even after a marathon struggle, the young players are still fighting to the bitter end. Even with Oppie so close to their goal, the Dunis are not prepared to give up and will try anything to smuggle the bar away. It is not long before an attempt is made with the bar clearly visible, only to be scuppered by Oppie vigilance. With the bar against the corner and Oppie's frantically trying to touch the wall, the Dunies are straining every sinew trying to stop them.
After some 20 minutes of play and where the Uppies have reached the corner on no fewer than three separate occasions only to be foiled by Spirit of Dunia assistance, the decisive break is made and the bar touches the wall at quarter to four. After several minutes, the claimants decide the winner of what has been another truly remarkable game. It is not long before Dean Campbell has lifted shoulder high at the Oppie goal. <laughs> 